Hello and welcome back to our second installment of histology. So we are now on to connective tissues. So again, just a heads up, I know the epithelial video is long. This one's probably going to be a little bit longer than normal. Um, but again, these are the two largest videos so far. Um, I typically try to keep them around 15 minutes or less. Um, but sometimes there's more than that to cover in one particular topic. So um, take a break, take a pause, come back and finish as you need to as you're going along and uh, moving through this material. So um, as I've kind of alluded to before, connective tissues are a very diverse group of tissues. They have various functions like transporting nutrients to the body, which would be the job of blood, or storing nutrients like fats, which would be the job of adipose tissue, or packaging and padding around um, organism, uh, organs, which could be like the adipose tissue or areolar or connective tissue, or even like um, your structure and support, which is like bone and cartilage. And so you can't have one tissue do all of those functions. So um, to be able to accomplish all of those jobs, we have to have a lot of different types of connective tissues. So they're broken down usually into a couple different groupings. We have connective tissue proper, loose and dense, we have solid supporting connective tissues and fluid connective tissues. So that's kind of how we're going to progress through this. And at the very end, we'll talk about membranes, which is a combination of both epithelial components and connective tissue components. Since we will have covered both of those things, we can hit membranes before we move into muscle. Um, before we move on, though, I did want to mention that um, all connective tissues do have three things in common, even though they're so diverse. All connective tissues have specialized cells. They all have extracellular ground substance. And they all have extracellular fibers. Okay, so even though we could be um, talking about things as diverse as blood versus bone, we are going to see each of these three components represented in each type of connective tissue. And then just for future reference for terminology wise, when we talk about what's called the extracellular matrix, the extracellular matrix is composed of both the ground substance and the fibers. The ground substance is kind of like the filling and the fibers is the, the fibers that kind of run through this filling. So that ground substance is gonna vary in consistency depending on the tissue that we're looking at. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. <coughs> First, we're gonna take a look at um, some cell components that you might find in various types of tissues. Not all of these cells will be found in all of the tissues, um, but in this example, we're just gonna walk through them all even though you only might be finding one or two at a time. And I don't have the same order because um, I don't have my notes here. I'm, I haven't been able to get back to campus um, before fall term starts. So I'm going to do it from memory, but I will cover everything in here. just may not be in the same order um, that your notes um, have it. So I'm just going to start kind of from the top. And I'll do the fibers at the end. So we'll skip the fibers. We'll just focus on the cells. So we have mast cells. Um, mast cells have little granules of histamine and heparin and other prostaglandins. They are involved in uh, inflammatory responses. So wherever you have connective tissues and mast cells, um, those tissues can in be involved in inflammation. We have fibroblasts, which are the cells that make fibers, just like their name implies, fibroblast. Blast is a root word that means maker. Um, we have macrophages, free and fixed macrophages. So they're part of the cell, part of your nonspecific immunity. They kind of roam around and munch up and gobble up um, dead cells or bacterial cells or cell debris or things like that. They're kind of like the cleanup crew. Mesenchymal cells are stem cells of connective tissue. So they can um, divide and differentiate into usually fibroblasts or adipocytes or maybe um, different types of other specialized cells in the connective tissue like chondrocytes or osteoblasts. Uh, lymphocytes are part of your immune system and plasma cells also. So those are dealing with uh, your immune response, which is good. You got these little uh, immune fighters in your connective tissues. Um, we have melanocytes over here, kind of going on this left-hand column. Melanocytes make melanin, so they're part of your pigment production. Um, adipocytes are fat cells. So uh, you could have adipocytes even in tissues that are not adipose tissue. So adipose tissue is almost entirely adipocytes but you could have some adipocytes, say, in like your uh, other loose connective tissues. Um, so those are the cells. And then elastic fibers, like their name implies, are stretchy. Collagen fibers are very thick and strong. And reticular fibers are very branched and supportive. 
and then we have some blood vessels that are just showing here and then ground substance is kind of that filling right that gooey filling stuff that's going to be in combination with the fibers gives you the extracellular matrix okay so let's take a look at some um, pictures of the different types of connective tissues we'll talk about their strength function so this first one is called areolar. We kind of just saw that a little bit. It's very nondescript. It's just a whole bunch of fibers and fibroblasts and, you know, a couple of those other cells that we saw. Areolar connective tissues is more uh, kind of support and padding, um, usually found just underneath epithelium. It is components of basement membrane. It's also found wrapped around organs. Um, here's some adipose. Adipose connective tissue is just adipose cells. So there really isn't anything else in there. There's some fluid ground substance. There's a few collagen fibers, but the specialized cells really are just adipocytes. And then down here, we have what's called reticular connective tissue. Oh, we, we know where adipose tissue is found, right? So under skin, breasts, buttocks, uh, abdomen, um, but also subcutaneous fat we find under all layers of skin. Reticular connective tissue is usually found in three-dimensional organs uh, like the liver, the spleen, um, the lymph nodes. It helps to give shape and structure because it's full of reticular fibers. So I'll use the bright yellow. So these, all these black lines that they're branching all over the place, those are those reticular connective tissue fibers. And then all the cells that are located in there um, those are the cells of the organ that they're giving the shape to. So those could be um, liver cells or bone marrow cells. I think that looks like this is from the bone marrow. Our slide in lab is from the bone marrow. So um, they just give this three-dimensional shape to those organs. So you'll, you'll see it found in multiple different places. All right, so those are loose connective tissues of connective tissue proper. Here are our dense connective tissues of connective tissue proper. So I'm just going to abbreviate here because it's a big long name. So we just want to call this one dense irregular connective tissue. It's dense. The fibers are running irregularly connective tissue. So dense irregular connective tissue. Um, we typically find this in the dermis. Right, so dense irregular connective tissue made up of the dermis. We can see it sitting on top of the hypodermis, which we just identified as adipose tissue. And above it is epidermis, which is going to be our stratified squamous epithelium. So we're seeing connections already between some of these tissues we've already identified. Um, and then this is dense regular connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue. Um, this is found in tendons and ligaments. So the collagen fibers are all running uh, in the same orientation, gives strength in that one direction. Whereas dense irregular connective tissue, because the collagen fibers are running in all different directions, like your skin, you can twist it and bend it and pull on it, and you're still going to have strength. You're not going to tear that dermis because those collagen fibers are going in all different directions. But your dense regular connective tissue, the Achilles tendon is very strong this way, but if you were to pull on it this way, it would separate, it would tear. So it's strength are really in the orientation of the collagen fibers. All right, so those are dense connective tissue propers. We had loose and dense. All right, um, before we move on into the solid and the loose or the fluid, um, just wanted to mention our fascia or fascia, you can pronounce it either way. It is a layering of connective tissues between the different layers, if you will, of our body. So we have um, our cutaneous membrane, which is basically our skin. And then just underneath that, we have what's called the superficial fascia, which has a couple other names. You might see it as the subcutaneous fat layer or the hypodermis. So superficial fascia is just the fat sitting just under the skin. And then between your other layers, you have usually muscle. They're showing kind of your oblique, um, sorry, your uh, intercostal muscles here. We have what's called the deep fascia. So this is primarily going to be a dense connective tissue. Um, where superficial fascia is loose, it's adipose, this is a dense, probably like a combination of dense regular and dense irregular, um, delineating the layers between the, this, the fascia and any muscle layers. And then lastly, we have subserous fascia. Um, so serous membrane is the inner lining just inside your body cavity. So just beneath that, the white line is a subserous fascia and that's areolar connective tissue. 
So that's a loose connective tissue, loose, dense, loose, and there's multiple layers depending on where in the body wall you're gonna find that. So this is really important because remember, almost all of these connective tissues are gonna have mast cells, which are part of the inflammatory process. So if you have rep repetitive injuries, traumas, bruising, you can trigger inflammation even deep inside. My cat, she's got a little cat treadmill and she's running on it. So that's the noise you hear. <laughs> she's being a turkey today. Um, okay, so those are, that's all your little layers of fascia. All right, so our fluid connective tissues. So your book lists lymph and blood. I um, respectfully decline to include lymph as a connective tissue because it does not check those three boxes of specialized cells, connective tissue or um, fibers and ground substance. To my knowledge, you know, I could be not informed, but to my knowledge, lymph does not contain any extracellular fibers. So it would not have that, um, in all the ingredients to be a connective tissue. So you can call it that because your book does. I just argue against that um, classification. So blood for sure, because clearly we have specialized cells. So red blood cells, white blood cells, and non-cellular things like platelets, but we also have fibers. You might be thinking, Fibers in your blood, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's um, called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is a soluble fiber. So it's this basically dissolved in your blood until you need it, and then it becomes fibrin. So fibrin is the fibers that actually make the blood clots. So if you remember back to our conversation on positive feedback, we had the blood cells all trapped in those little fibers. That's fibrin that comes from fibrinogen, which is found in blood. So it does check all of the boxes because then the ground substance is your plasma, the fluidy part of blood. All of this would be the plasma. So it does check all of the boxes, specialized cells, extracellular fibers, and extracellular ground substance. Now for now, I'm not going to be asking you to learn all the names of your white blood cells. You just can call them white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets for now. In the future, you will have to learn and identify all of your white blood cells, but for now, just we're just at the tissue level. We're not jumping into the, the study on blood. That's by 233 stuff. All right, so those are fluid connective tissues. So now we're gonna move on into our solid connective tissues. We're gonna start with cartilage. We're gonna talk a little bit about how cartilage grows and then we'll take a look at its structure and then we'll jump into bone next. So cartilage is an interesting connective tissue because most other connective tissues, especially up to this point with a few exceptions, um, are very uh, good at replenishing themselves because they had those mesenchymal stem cells. So you can repair dense regular connective tissue. You can repair adipose and areolar and reticular pretty darn well. Um, blood is clearly um, replaceable. Dense regular, not so much. Um, collagen fibers are hard to repair, but cartilage doesn't really repair itself at all. Um, if any of you have had cartilage injuries, like maybe a meniscus in your knee or shoulder um, pads or anything like that, it doesn't heal very well. And one of the main reasons is because it's avascular, which means it does not contain a direct blood supply. Good blood supply is a good indication of whether a tissue will be able to regenerate itself. And since cartilage doesn't have a good blood supply, it, it can't really repair itself. It can go to scar tissue, but scar tissue is not cartilage. And so it can't function the same way. With that being said, um, the matrix is the com composition, remember, of the ground substance and the fibers. So cartilage has a more gel-like, flexible, solid gel-like um, ground substance with the fibers, whether it's collagen or elastic fibers blended in. And that's what we're gonna call the matrix. The cells, the specialized cells within cartilage are called chondrocytes. Chondra means cartilage and site means cell. And they are completely surrounded by this solid matrix. So if there is any damage to for the cells to get their nutrients and get rid of, get rid of waste products, it's got to diffuse through this matrix. And diffusion doesn't go very quickly or is a very efficient when it's a solid matrix. So that's another reason why the repair doesn't happen very well. Within the matrix, there's these little pockets. They're called lacuna. 
like a little pocket and the cell lives in the little pocket. So the cell is the chondrocyte, it lives in the pocket of lacuna, surrounded by matrix. So let's say you're a baby in utero and you're growing, you're growing your nose cartilage or you're growing your bone cartilage or your rib cage cartilage, you need to make more cartilage. So you as an infant, uh, a fetus growing in utero, your uh, chondrocytes will go through mitosis and they'll divide. And then each chondrocyte then will start secreting the extracellular matrix. So that's this new dark stuff, this new matrix. And they'll just slowly start kind of pushing each other apart. And that's going to make the whole um, piece of cartilage get bigger if the cells are dividing and each new cell is secreting new matrix. This is called interstitial growth because it's growing from the inside out. The next type of growth is called appositional growth because it's going from the edge, from the surface out. Um, there is a connective tissue sheath that surrounds cartilage called the perichondrium, peri meaning surrounding, chondra is cartilage, so surrounding cartilage. It's primarily a dense connective tissue made up with fibroblasts, right? So here's our fibroblasts. Um, the fibroblasts on that boundary between the matrix and the perichondrium get surrounded by the matrix. So as you can kind of see this guy is halfway surrounded. This was a fibroblast. Once it's surrounded by matrix, fibroblasts have the ability to change their identity and become chondrocytes. So once a fibroblast is surrounded by matrix, it becomes a chondrocyte and it can then start secreting matrix. And it will continue to do that, basically converting all of these close in fibroblasts into chondrocytes. And if you'll notice, the fibroblasts are going through mitosis to replace the fibroblasts that become chondrocytes. So this is growing cartilage from the outside edge and increasing its size in that location. Now, when we talk about cartilage growth, it only happens usually in, uh, during utero, obviously during development um, as you're growing in the womb. But, and as a child, once you reach your mat adult maturity, like between 18 and 20-ish, you don't really do this kind of growth anymore. So this is all developmental growth. As an adult person, we don't really have this growth anymore. You have the cartilage that you're always going to have. If you damage it, there's very limited repair or there's surgical repair. So... Um, take care of your cartilages because you can't really grow them back. So here's our different types of cartilage. I'm showing uh, micrographs and kind of drawing to help illustrate some of these things. So our um, three main types of cartilage, this first one is called hyaline. Hyaline cartilage is the most common type of cartilage. Um, it is found in your nose cartilage, your costal cartilages, and it's found at the ends of your long bones. Right, And it's also part of the fetal skeleton starts as hyaline cartilage. The matrix is collagen fibers and this flexible uh, ground substance. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can't really see the collagen fibers. They're there, but the ground substance is kind of um, overshadowing that. So your matrix is very homogenous, right? You don't really see a lot of collagen fibers. You can see the lacunas, right, the pockets, and then the cells inside. And what's kind of cool, like right here, you can kind of see where that might be some interstitial growth because you got like two little cells with the, the dark nuclei right next to each other. So they may have been one cell that divided and it's going to start interstitial growthing apart. And here might be another example of that where they're a little bit further apart. There might be another example of that. So that's kind of cool. Some examples of interstitial growth. This is elastic cartilage. I know that yellow is not really showing up that well. Um, elastic cartilage, you can see the lacuna, right, with the cells inside. But what's also really visible is all of those elastic fibers, those dark staining elastic fibers here. Here's the lacuna, here's the cell inside, and then all of the fibers. So you can see the matrix. It's a little bit more flexible. It's your elastic cartilage, but you can also see the elastic fibers within that matrix. Um, it serves for structure with flexibility. So it is the um, cartilage of your ear flap and your epiglottis. So that little flap that closes down over your trachea when you swallow. So I always remember ear, epiglottis, epiglottis elastic, because they all start with E. And then this last one, I'll use a different color. This is fibro 
cartilage or sometimes called fibrous cartilage. Um, this is very dense. It's got a high proportion of collagen fibers, so much so that you can actually see them, right? So all of these wiggly like lines, they're not super strong in here, but you can kind of see them. Those are the collagen fibers. Um, you can see the little lacunas here, all of these little pockets are the lacunas with the chondrocytes inside. So there's not as many chondrocytes in fiber, fiber cartilage. It's mainly the dense matrix and the collagen fibers. Fiber cartilage is good for um, compression resistance. So we find it in the um, vertebral discs of our vertebrae, and we find it in the menisci of our knees, the pads of cartilage between our femur and our tibia, helps with compression resistance. So that's our fiber cartilage. So our three types are hyaline, elastic and fibro cartilage. Okay. One last connective tissue is bone. One of the prettiest, I think. I like bone under the microscope. It's super cool. So bone has a solid matrix. It has extracellular fibers of collagen and the extracellular ground substance is a calcium phosphate crystal salt. And it's in a two um, to three no, not two to three, that's the wrong ratio. Um, what am I trying to say? It is one third collagen and two thirds crystal. So the collagen allows bones to be somewhat flexible, so not super brittle, and the crystalline matrix gives it strength. So we have strength with some flexibility. Um, we can't really see it too well, but each one of these little black specks right here, that is an osteocyte living in its lacuna. Okay, so each one of these tiny, tiny little specks, let's see if I can get the light blue down here. So I'll circle, each one of these little blue circles are gonna represent an osteocyte, that's the specialized cell, in a lacuna, its little pocket within this solid extracellular matrix. In um, this, compact bone, which we see as compact bone, the extracellular matrix is organized in layers and the layers are organized in these circular structures called osteons. We're gonna see this more in chapter six when we actually get to the skeletal structure, the skeletal system. But here I'll highlight it in the blue. This is one osteon, okay? In the middle of the osteon, we have what's called a central canal. This is just an open canal, blood vessels travel through there. And then we have these layers. The matrix kind of organizes itself in these layers, almost like the rings of a tree. And these layers are called lamellae. Lamellae is just um, another word that means layer. So in this orange picture down here, I'll circle all of the osteons. Okay. In the brown picture over here, these are all osteons. So you'll notice each osteon is gonna have a central canal and many layers. And sandwiched between the layers, these are going to be the osteocytes living in their lacuna. And what they have, I think in the black and white one, you can see a little bit better. You see all these little kind of hazy looking lines branching off of the lacuna. Those are called canaliculi. Little canal is what it means. I'll try to write it. Canaliculi. Um, it allows for exchange between the cells and the central canal, because remember, they are complete, these cells are completely surrounded by a solid matrix. Um, you can't diffuse nutrients and waste products through a solid matrix. So you have to have these little passages for the cells to communicate to each other and eventually to the central canal, which allows them to have a um, connection to the blood supply. So that's our solid connective tissue, bone, you can call it bone, or if you want to call it osseous tissue, that's his more anatomical term. All right, so that's all of our connective tissues. So like I said, it's very diverse, all the way from liquid blood to solid bone and everything in between. The last slide to wrap this up is a conversation about membranes. Membranes, biological membranes, not cell membranes, right? So cell membranes are at the cellular level, phospholipid bilayers. We're talking about tissue membranes. Um, surrounding different body parts. So a membrane in anatomy and physiology class is in reference to connective tissue and epithelial tissue working together to cover some surface. So I'm going to cover, um, just kind of talk about these real quick. So 
muc mucose membranes. These are found lining passageways to the outside world. So that would be mucose membranes are found lining your respiratory tract, your digestive tract, your urinary tract, your reproductive tracts. So those are mucose membranes. Um, the epithelium varies depending on where you're going to find it. So in your you know, middle of your digestive, it might be simple columnar epithelium. In your trachea, it might be pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. In your urinary tract, it might be transitional epithelium, but they all are sitting on their basement membrane of areolar connective tissue. Serous membranes are found lining your closed cavities. So your open passageways are mucose, your closed cavities are serous. So way back in chapter one, we learned about your ventral and uh, dorsal body cavities. Of your ventral body cavities, say like the lining of your pericardial sac, you have this pericardial membrane. Uh, it's called the pericardium. You have your pleural membrane. You have your peritoneum, which surrounds your abdominal pelvic cavity. So those are your serous membranes, and they're only a simple squamous sitting on top of an areolar connective tissue basement membrane. Cutaneous membrane is a dry membrane. This is your skin, part of your integumentary system. So it is epithelium, which is uh, stratified squamous epithelium, sitting on top of your basement membrane of areolar connective, or part of the dermis is areolar connective tissue, and then your dermis is dense irregular connective tissue. So that's going to be true around um, all of your skin, your cutaneous membrane. And then lastly, we have synovial membrane, which is kind of an interesting one because it's not a true epithelium. If you'll notice, the epithelium is in quotes here, epithelium. Um, but it sits on top of some areolar connective tissue. The synovial membrane lines the synovial joint capsules um, in your movable joints. So wherever you have a movable joint, like your elbow, your shoulder, your wrist, your fingers, your neck, your knee, all of those things, you have these little um, capsules um, surrounding your joint. And the lining of those, right, this little red membrane here, um, that is your synovial membrane. It secretes the synovial fluid that lubricates your joints. All right, so when we talk about these uh, connective tissue membranes or um, anatomical membranes, this is what we're talking about. So mucose, in your open passageways, serous in your closed cavities, cutaneous is your skin, synovial are your joint, um, lining your joint cavities. Okay, a little bit shorter than the epithelial tissues. So um, again, like I promised, muscle and nervous will be way shorter. And um, this usually takes three or four lecture days in a real life class. So don't feel that you have to um, Take all of this in at once. You can always pause, give yourself a break, and come back and review and add new stuff. So make sure you're taking it um, bit by bit and not overwhelming yourself, but also staying in line with the pace of the course. Again, as always, send questions. Bring questions to the lab sections. Um, send me emails. Come to office hour. Um, and I will see you next time for the integumentary system, our first body system. Okay, bye.